Angle is probably best known as one of the greatest heels in the history of WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. That's right. He's a professional wrestler. The guys who jump off the top rope and hit each other with chairs. However, he is also one of our great Olympic gold medalists in real life. That he actually competed in the Olympics and won gold for America. And what's really interesting about his story is in the 1996 trials for the Olympics, he actually broke his neck, fracturing a couple vertebrae and slipping some discs, and proceeded to actually win the Olympic trials with a broken neck. So why do I start this video with this story? Well, it's to illustrate a really important point that we oftentimes overlook in the world of martial arts in the search for self-defense, and that is... Things that would make your opponent tap out aren't necessarily things that would actually win a fight in a self-defense situation. Because we can see illustrated through the profound will of Kurt Angle that you can have an injury as severe as breaking your neck and continue to press forward. I've seen many judo Olympians break their um, elbow in the middle of a fight and just can keep on going despite the pain. As a matter of fact, I'm sure most of you probably know of or at least have heard of a high school football player who broke a rib or broke a toe or broke a knee while playing the game and just finished out the game and didn't tell anybody because he, he had the will to win. It's not saying that the tap out is, should be gotten rid of. That's not what the argument in this video is. It's more of a recognition of the difference between a fight ending tap out and a potentially fight ending tap out. Specifically in the world of self-defense, where we are talking about defending yourself against a rapist, defending yourself against a mugger, defending yourself against um, a drunk guy swinging on you, self-defense situations, really not all tap outs would equal victory, but most every tap out makes victory more likely. So let me explain. So if I am in an altercation with somebody, and I break their elbow, whether that is with an arm bar or like a wacky katami, like that's like a, almost, almost like a armpit arm bar for those of you who don't know. Um, if, if I were to break their elbow, a sober person would probably be done fighting. Most people would probably be done fighting. But if they're on some sort of drugs that make it so they can't recognize the pain or they're just freaking crazy and keep moving forward, the broken arm doesn't necessarily end the fight. It just makes the fight that much easier to win. However, something like a choke in which you restrict blood, uh, blood to the brain and the person passes out, that obviously wins the fight. That There's just no tough guys with chokes. And so when we're practicing self-defense, we want to think about becoming experts in the tools that end the fight guaranteed, not necessarily the tools that might win the fight. And that's an important um, distinction to make. Now, I am not calling for us to stop doing arm bars or stop doing ankle locks, but I am calling for a larger emphasis in the self-defense world for um, things like chokes in which are actually going to end the fight guaranteed. So if you're rolling with someone or you're practicing grappling with someone and you're striving to become a self-defense expert, instead of considering all taps equal, instead consider that you have different layers of taps. So it's also important to differentiate between street fighting and self-defense. Street fighting is illegal and it's not really a concern of mine or of my schools. Street fighting is when two people have agreed to fight um, and anything goes, but they both have uh, decided to fight each other. Whereas self-defense, we're talking more when one party wants to fight and the other party doesn't want to fight. So this could be a drunk guy at a bar. This could be a mugging. This could be a rapist. This could um, just be one of your friends who uh, has, has lost control. Maybe you said something you should shouldn't have, uh, and they decided to swing on you. Though that that's self-defense. So, that, so that's how we're defining self-defense. I'm not talking about street fighting. That's not self-defense. Um, that's illegal and it's stupid. So in the world of self-defense, chokes are pure self-defense, whereas joint locks are powerful tools to aid you in winning the fight. So I am not saying that 
breaking someone's arm would never win a fight. But what I am saying is that breaking someone's arm is less guaranteed to win a fight than choking someone unconscious. When you put someone in a rear naked choke, you rob their blood, their brain of blood, and usually within about 10 seconds, they go to sleep. Now, when you let go of the choke, within seconds, they tend to wake back up, but they're disoriented, they're confused. A lot of times, they don't know what happened. You are giving ample time to get away from someone if you choke them. However, as we can see through the illustration of Kurt Angle, that extraordinary damage to the body under the right circumstances can be ignored. You can break someone's elbow and they can keep moving forward. You can snap someone's wrist and they can keep moving forward. I am not making an argument to get rid of those submissions, but rather just whenever you're rolling, whenever you're practicing with your partner, recognize the submissions that are going to actually end the fight guaranteed and the submissions that are just going to make the fight a little bit easier to win. And that's kind of the way we look at, at it in the school of self-defense. The primary system that we teach is called combative defense system. And we teach arm bars and we teach ankle locks and we teach wrist locks. We teach all that. But the first two submissions you learn are going to be a guillotine choke and a rear naked choke. Those are absolutely the first two I introduce you to. And it's because I want you to have a deep relationship with choking as submissions as opposed to going straight for arm locks and shoulder locks. If you'd be interested in studying self-defense with us here in Indianapolis, all the information you need to do so is in the description box down below. Also, if you're still watching this video, you clearly enjoyed it. So please be sure to like and subscribe and do me a favor and share this video with your friends so you can help our channel grow. Until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.